Hello everyone and welcome to Housing Today Live. My name is Carl Brown, I'm the Head of Content at the Several Media Group and I'm chairing this first session of the day which is all about the regulatory changes in social housing that are being implemented um, following the uh, tragic death of two-year-old Awab Ishak in Rochdale. Um, Awab's law introduced in the landmark Social Housing Regulation Act 2023 requires landlords to investigate and fix reported health hazards within specified timeframes. In this, in this session, we will discuss a bit more about what these changes are, what they mean for housing providers and how they can best be um, tackled. Um, luckily, we have a fantastic panel today to, to discuss all of this with us, who I shall now introduce. We have um, Amanda Stubbs, who's a partner at Trowers and Hamlins. We have Neil Ackrell, who is Chief Operating Officer at Hyde Group. And we have Helen Buchan, who's Head of Product at JLA. Each of our panelists will speak for around 10 minutes each, which should leave us plenty of time for your questions at the end. And please do get involved. So um, to ask a question, you simply use the drop down menu on the side of your screen. Um, it should be quite, quite simple to use. Um, but that's enough from me. I'm now going to bring in our first speaker, who's Amanda Stubbs from Trowers and Hamlins. Amanda, over to you. Thanks very much, Carl. Um, what I'd like to look at in the sort of brief, as this brief introductory piece is to explain some of the legislative context and the timescales in which this new regime is coming into force. Because interestingly, most of the legislation is, is, is there already, um, but this is a sort of sharpening up and, and introducing timescales and, and sort of tightening the thumb screws in effect. So we'll look at some of the key provisions and objectives of OARB's law. Um, and then we'll sort of try and explore the implications of, of how these changes are going to affect registered providers. So in terms of where this legislation is coming in, it's come out of the Social Housing Regulation Act, came in last year. Not all the provisions are yet in force. Uh, and the levelling up white paper. The, the primary driver for all this was the sad case of a little boy who suffered respiratory failure caused in part by the damp and mould in his home. And... The focus has been very much since then on damp and mould as a particular health hazard. But the outcome of the case is, in fact, a sort of renewed focus on decency of, of UK housing stock and specifically social housing, because social housing tenants are likely to be or could be more vulnerable to the health and safety hazards that the law is there to prevent due to an increased risk of poverty, pre-existing health conditions and disabilities. So the focus of this is, is this new legislation is very much on, on social housing landlords. And the aim of the levelling up white paper is to reduce what's called non-decency, as in homes that aren't decent, rental properties that aren't decent, by 50% by 2030. So that that is quite a... a it, it sounds like a, a, a big statistic. I, I suspect the number of non-decent homes is actually not that many, but that we've still got to reduce that target by 50% uh, in the next uh, five, six years. Um, the legislative requirements are very much focused on social housing landlords and their need to investigate and fix reported health hazards within specified timeframes. Now, there's been a recent consultation that's intended to determine those timeframes. And, and I'll, I'll talk on that uh, more in a, in a moment. But basically, the consultation only closed on the 9th of March. So the outcomes of that are not, are not yet known. But the new rules that are coming in, so AWAB's law, as it's sort of colloquially known, will form part of tenancy agreements. So they're being introduced through the Landlord and Tenant Act of 1985, so that tenants can effectively hold their landlords to account if they fail to provide a decent home. The details of this are going to come in through secondary legislation. So again, can't say too much about the detail of it now, but essentially registered providers are going to have to investigate health hazards. Now, the, there is existing legislation on this in the housing health and safety rating system. There are 29 health hazards and this new legislation is not just about mould and damp. It will also include things like fire safety, heat, overheating, houses that are too cold and so on. There's 29 different hazards that are already enshrined in law. And the concept is that they will have 14 days 
from a complaint with which to provide the resident complainant with the findings. So they've got to investigate the hazard and, and respond to a resident within 14 days. The, these numbers uh, are, are the subject of the consultation and, and secondary legislation, so they could change, but this is the proposal currently. Um, registered providers will then have seven days within which to begin repairs if a medical professional considers that there's a risk to the resident's health. Residents that have applied to be rehoused on health grounds due to the risk posed by their existing property must be given the highest priority where the move has been recommended by a medical professional. And I think this is really interesting because this is going to bring in GPs in effect and also consultants in, in, in primary healthcare trusts to get involved with the conditions in which a, a, a resident is living. And they won't do house calls. They will do that on the basis of what they're being told by the residents is, is an issue within the property. So if they're seeing somebody who's got breathing difficulties and respiratory problems and the uh, resident is saying to the, their GP or to their consultant that they've got, they're living in a property that's not, not fit in their opinion, the chances are the medical professional will make a recommendation that they be rehoused. And that's not going to be based on uh, a house call. So uh, there's a big change there, I would suggest. Also, that there does it does involve the fact that the GPs and house uh, medical professionals are potentially already overwhelmed, and, and to what extent this actually will be practical, I, I don't know. Um, and then the sort of other main limb of the legislation is that the registered providers must give tenants information on their rights to a decent home. So they must provide information about what standards to expect um, under the housing health and safety rating system. In other words, what the 29 hazards are and their right to complain. And this information must be either in plain English or another appropriate language. So and, and these sort of obligations on landlords will be implied into tenancy agreements so that there is a, a, a right automatically to, to have a property that's fit for human habitation. So in terms of where we go with this, um, as I've sort of outlined already, it's a certain amount of this legislation is already in place. And what this uh, sort of a WABS law is trying to do is codify those existing provisions within a tightened structure. And one of the ways that's going to happen is through the introduction of a health and safety lead within registered providers. Now, that that role is already probably existing in most uh, registered provider organisations, but that entity, that person must monitor their um, entity, the registered provider's compliance with health and safety uh, requirements, um, must assess the risks of failure to comply with health and safety requirements um, and notify the responsible body of the provider, so the, the social housing regulator, where risks assessed as being material failures by the provider to comply with health and safety, um, those must be notified to the to the, um, re, uh, the regulator and also actual material failures by the provider to comply with their health and safety requirements. So interestingly, that again is something which I would suggest is already enshrined in legislation or certainly within the regulations of the health of, sorry, the housing regulator. But it's it's all being brought to the fore by this new legislation, which details of which we haven't yet got. But you can see very clearly with what we've got so far in the Social Housing Regulation Act, uh, the trajectory, the way this is going. So I'll, I'll hand back to Carl now. But that's basically the introduction to the legislation. We've got a codification of much legislation we already know of and have on the statute books but within this tightening framework of timescales and points to to address specifically thank you amanda and i, th I thought that was a really um good way of, of kicking off the debate a really uh, useful overview of the legislation and some of the, the broader context also um we now go to neil Ackrell of hyde group neil over to you Thanks very much, Carl. Uh, I've got a presentation just that I'd like to uh, load on the screen, if you bear with me. Uh, 
hopefully you can see that now. Um, I just wanted to look at probably more of the practicalities of uh, what's, what the proposal is, uh, what we're doing at Hyde, what our thoughts are of the uh, proposal, what we've done in consultation, and more importantly, how we're going to adhere to it and where our approach has been at Hyde. So I think, first of all, it's really important that you know, I'll give you a bit of background in terms of Hyde, first of all. We're a, I would say we're a medium-sized housing association. We've got 45,000 homes, all varying types of construction, uh, a third of which are in London, a third are in Kent, a third are in Sussex. We've also got some stock in uh, Hampshire and in Peterborough. So I think we've got a good spread of properties. I think we're not dissimilar to many. We're spending an awful lot more on our homes than what we used to in the past. Uh, as we can see here, we're spending 1.2 million a billion pounds more over the next five years than what we've done previously. Um, we're really proud to do that and we think it's necessary. We've also seen a sharp um, increase in demand for our services. So since Christmas alone, we've seen a 25% peak in repair demand. So I think it's fair to say that the number of requests we receive from our customers has increased. We're trying to understand why. I think expectation levels are definitely increased and the, the services required, the standards required are probably increased as well. And I think that's all very fair because it's all part of modern living and it's something we need to embrace. But I think what's really been clear for us at Hyde was, you know, with the, you know, putting Arab Law to one side for a second, you know, the whole way in which we communicate with our customers needed to change. You know, we was aware that, um, from everything we've heard in the past uh, for Grenfell and everything else, speaking to our customers is so, so important. And quite frankly, if we're being honest, at Hyde, we wasn't doing that very well. So we've done a number of things over the last 12 months. The biggest thing we did was to introduce a new neighbourhood model, and that's reducing the patch size of our neighbourhoods uh, by a third. And we've done that on purpose. So we've actually got more people on the ground talking to our customers to understand their needs, to improve communication, and hopefully to understand some of the issues uh, that they th face in everyday life. And I think I'll be first to say that we wasn't great at doing that before, and I think we're getting better now. I think it's important to recognize that this is a this is a journey. And whilst we embedded the model in the first, uh, whilst we've introduced the model in the first 12 months, what we need to know now is to embed that properly. And that is a change of um, culture, a change of the way in which we work at Hyde. So generally, when we do talk to our customers, generally listening and adapting to those needs, so that's important for us. To do that, we've got a new customer service centre, and on that service centre, we try and be transactional, so we can try to carry out some requests as we receive, receive them. And we're looking at a range of new digital platforms, so our customers can contact us either by the phone or through these digital channels to make it a lot easier for them. So there's, there's a bit of a journey going on at Hyde, which I think is really key. And then Arabs Law is obviously something that we totally do embrace. Uh, we've supported it wholeheartedly. You know, we really think it's an important thing to do for damp mold and uh, condensation. And we've obviously um, proactively worked on the consultation to, to give our views. I think we really sort of, we support the key proposals. The key proposals being 14 days to investigate a hazard. I think that's totally reasonable. Two weeks to do an investigation to find out what we need to do. I think totally practical. We'd all um, say that's the right thing to do. A written report, I have to say, I'm not, I don't think that's wholly needed in every instance. I think good communication is definitely needed. Does it need a written report? I think it, it depends on the degree of what we find when we go into a home. And we can talk about some of the categorization levels a bit later as we get into this. Seven days to begin a repair. Again, we think that's totally reasonable. Um, we also feel that in many cases, we might want to do that a lot sooner, and, and indeed we do. So I think we totally embrace that. Reasonable time frame is always debatable, because what does reasonable time frame mean? But certainly, I think every single one of us who works in housing, when we see some of the photographs, and let's be honest, many of us have all seen such incidents in a number of our homes. Um, you know. It, when we see it on the TV about others, we all look. Uh, we never think ours are quite that bad, but when we do get a problem, we want to resolve it really quickly. And I think um, reasonable time frame, absolutely, we need to do that. And emergencies, we, we try to attend our emergencies in four hours rather than 24, but we wholeheartedly agree that. And obviously, if we can't resolve it straight away, temporary accommodation is definitely something that we support. 
some of the challenges, however, though, where I think that we need to be careful what's being proposed is when we look at HHSRS, you know, as Amanda rightly said before, there's 29 different categories in there. And also we've got categories, category one and category two hazards. You know, category one hazards are the ones that, you know, we should really take notice of because they're potentially life-threatening or certainly serious harm and injury to an individual. And then you've got category two hazards. I think when I personally think of damp mould condensation, when I look at mould, I'm not a scientist, I can't tell you how dangerous that mould is. What I can tell you is how severe I think it is and how quickly we need to act. So I think we, regardless of the type of damp and mould, we review that all the same, and that's what the Act's telling us to do. I think when you look at some of the other categories, which we can talk about a bit later in HHSRS, I'm not so sure that is true, because I think some are clearly more urgent than others, depending on the severity. So I think that that's the first area that we just uh, put some caution to and, and challenge. I'll move on to the next slide. So what we're doing to uh, improve, the first thing that we've done at Hyde is that we bought all our repairs in house because we thought that was really important because we realized that we're working in a constantly changing environment. We need all our operatives on hand uh, to go to where we need them to go to and to change the standards quickly when that's what we decide to do. So over 90% of our service now are all in house. So that's helped us no, no end. In terms of what we do around a damp mold, and condensation we've now um, created our own dedicated team we've got 29 people in that team we've got a range of um, contractors our own services but also external contractors assisting us and specialists uh, we apply a triage system so as soon as we receive a call that goes to a specialist individual who will actually look at the facts and decide what we need to do um, that could be ascertaining whether there's a leak that we need to resolve or whether we need to go and do some mold cleaning or whatever we need to do. So that is then prioritised. The urgent stuff is done as an emergency. And then the follow up survey and the subsequent works, obviously, we try to adhere to the time scale. So that's what we've changed within Hyde. And specifically, the other thing that we said is so, so important is that there's a high risk if a property has suffered from damp mold or condensation in the past, there might be a problem in the future. So therefore, we have a rolling six monthly program to relook at every property where we've looked where we've had their mould condensation to make sure that it's still being maintained and um, and taken care of. If not, obviously, we instigate necessary action. And this isn't come cheap. This has cost us two million pounds um, over the last year extra to what we've done before. And we probably expect to spend similar money again in addition to what we did the previous year in this this coming financial year. I think understanding our stock is really, really important. And we currently have inspected uh, something like 92% of our stock has had a stock condition survey over, over the last five years. So we embrace that. But that was disrupted due to lockdown. So we're actually carrying out double the numbers now to get back to 100% survey. But I totally um, you know, approve the idea of actually doing a regular five-year details stock condition survey so we can understand our stock and hopefully get heads up to where we need to put some of our attention so i've talked about the main the main parts for us i'm going to stop sharing my screen now uh, i've talked about the main points for us but some of the points that i would pick up from hhsrs you know if i if i look at some of the things on there such as crowding and space that another category personal hygiene sanitation drainage you know, these can be complex areas. These can be areas that take a lot of time to understand, to work with our customers, to understand vulnerabilities in order to get a solution. When you're dealing with an issue such as hoarding, overcrowding, you know, it could be mental health issues. It could be numerous issues. And I just think there needs to be caution in terms of understanding categories in terms of is it a category one category? Is it category two? Uh, and also the type of areas we're working in, because I think what's really important for us is every single person across the section, sector is probably very similar to Hyde at the moment. You know, we need to use our resources wisely. Most of us are saying actually that our, our service now is no longer cost neutral or it's barely cost neutral because it's costing us an awful lot of money to manage. So we need to do it wisely and we need to focus on the most urgent areas first and prioritise. 
And I think damp mould and condensation is certainly one of those areas for us. And that's why we, we totally embrace AWIP's law. I think when we look at some of the other areas on HHSRS, I'm not sure if that would actually take us away from a sensible approach to prioritisation. And that was the uh, basis of um, our consultation um, in relation to this matter. So I'll stop there and uh, pass you back to Carl. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Um, it's really interesting to see how Hyde is responding to the shifting uh, regulatory landscape. Important, important points there about communication with residents, um, working to understand stock and about um, sort of investment priorities, I suppose, as well. So really, really good stuff. Um, I'm now going to move to our third and final speaker, who's Helen Buchan of JLA. Helen, over to you. Thanks, Carl. Uh, thanks, Neil, as well. That was a, a great presentation. Um, so I'm uh, Helen. I'm uh, the head of product at JLA, uh, and I want to share um, with you um, the, the journey that we've been on um, with one of our products. Um, a key part of my role um, is to make sure we've got the right products um, to serve our customers' needs in all of the sectors that, that, that we serve. Um, so I'm just going to start to share my uh, my screen and my my slides. So just bear with me. Um, I want to share. Um, Hopefully everyone can, um, can can see my screen now. Um, I want to share some some case studies um, that, that we've done. Uh, we've been working with um, lots of housing associations. So at JLA, we have um, a product which is um, a portable sanitizer, uh, and it uses um, ozone technology. Um, it kills bacteria, viruses. Um, and it can also remove mold spores both from the air um, and on surfaces. Um, this is a product that um, we've, you know, it's been widely, wild, widely used. Um, sorry, in the care sector for for a really long time. Um, it's used in hospitals as well, um, in other settings where um, viruses and, and bacteria. Um, pose a, a risk uh, to people within the premises. Um, so we, um, we, we've we tested in the past our, our mold spores, but the, the tests in the environments that we, we, we've carried out um, are environments where mold is of a, um, dare I say it, you know, a, a, a normal level mold. Mold spores are all around us in, in the air that, that, that we breathe. Um, but never at the level that, that, that we've, we've experienced um, within the housing sector. So we were really keen to work with housing associations um, to, do some, to do some testing in, in the environments um, that, that the, the housing sector um, you know, sees on a, uh, on a regular basis. So I'll, I'll just move on to, um, so this is one of the first sites um, that, 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 that we were asked um, to, to go to. Um, I, I think this probably is, um, you know, it is one of the worst uh, ones that, 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 that we've ever seen. You know, I think we were, we were all quite shocked. Um, this property, um, it, it buoyed um, at, at the moment. Um, so the way the sanitizer works is, um, we would recommend the housing association do a deep clean of the room first and foremost to get rid of all signs of visible mold. Um, and then uh, once the deep clean has been completed, um, we put the sanitizer into the room uh, that the sanitizer operates. Um, and um, when it's safe to re-enter the room, when the sanitizer cycle is finished, uh, it goes through a destruction cycle as well to make sure that the room's safe uh, for reoccupation afterwards. Um, you, obviously, you, you, can, you can go back into the room. Um, we did some um, air and surface sampling um, before the deep clean, air and surface sampling after the deep clean, um, then we operated the sanitizer and we did air and surface, sam uh, surface samples um, after the sanitizer had been operated as well. 
Um, on the next side, um, so this is a property. Um, this was a, a council owned property. They literally just bought the property um, and this was the, the, the condition that the, the, the property was in. Um, so, you know, I, again, I think um, uh, probably uh, we were a little bit um, uh, shocked and surprised at how bad the, the, the damp and the mould was. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that the longer that we've been on this journey, uh, the, the, the conditions that you see here are, are, are quite typical if a property's got um, a, a bad case of, of mould and damp. And then um, this tip, this particular property, um, you probably can't see from, from the photograph so clearly. Um, I can only describe the property as it was just, it was wet. It, it was really wet. The, the, there, were, were, there were lots of leaks. Um, you probably can't see from the, the photographs very well, but uh, some of the items um, that had, uh, obviously had been left in, in the kitchen were absolutely um, covered in, in mould. Um, there was mould um, on the back wall, sort of where the, uh, above the kitchen extractor, um, but yeah, it was just, it was so, it, it, it was wet. It, it was wet, really, really wet. Um, you know, um, you could feel the, the, the wet in the air. Um, the particular resident that was living in this property, um, it, she'd been moved into temporary accommodation. She was a, a, in a hotel. Um, she had a problem um, with a lung. Um, and so naturally, um, she was really worried um, about living in this property. Um, one of the things I will say is that when we arrived on site, um, she was so um, relieved um, and, and happy to see us. And she was um, she was really happy that a housing association were, were taking positive steps um, to do something um, and, and to try and um, resolve the situation. Um, we advised that we were just going to be um, testing and operating the sanitizer just in this one room. Um, and it, she was pretty keen for us to do the entire house, but obviously we explained we were just on that particular day. We were just there to um, to, to, to have a look at, at the kitchen. Um, so yeah, I think the probably my biggest takeaway from from this particular site was um, the residents' reaction. Um, you know, she 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 was really really assured, um, and um, you could just tell that you know she um, she had a, a good relationship with, with the housing association. Um, so it really uh, it really bolstered um, and, and put her mind um, at, at ease. So um, these pictures just show you yeah, um, typically. Um, so just so that you can see the the, the, the size of the sanitizer um, in, in a in a in a particular property. Um, they're on wheels. They're really easy to to, to move around. So um, the housing associations that we've worked with. Um, they have their own specialist uh, repair team uh, and they're the ones that typically would complete the mould wash. Um, so um, they're the people then that would that would operate the, 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 the sanitizer. Um, the housing associations that we've worked with so far, um, they seem to have a, a central depot um, where we deliver the sanitizer or sanitizers depending on how much um, how many they, 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 they want to take. Um, and that's where um, we deliver them to, and then I think they just they sign them in and sign them out um, on a on a daily or on a weekly basis, or however often they they need to use them. Um, this next slide, I just want to give you some examples of the of the, the, the sampling that we did. Um, so uh, this is the, the the surface samples. So you can see um, on the left hand side of the screen. Um, they're the, um, the, the, the plates um, that show um, that the top um, is uh, aerobic mesophilic bacteria and then the yeast and moulds um, are on the, the, the bottom two plates. So the left hand side um, is before we operated the sanitizer, and then on the right hand side um, is, um, is after the, 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 the sanitizer uh, was operated. Um, and then we've got some air sample uh, plates. Um, so you can see this was um, before we operated um, the sanitizer. Um, and then 
this is the one of the plates um, after the sanitizer was operated. Um, I think the key thing for me um, in terms of sharing our journey and our learnings, um, you know, so that the, the housing sector um, and putting our sanitizer product into the housing sector, you know, that that's I think we're very much at the at the start of our of our journey here. So you know, we, we're we're taking our learnings all the time. Um, in the um, some of the initial testing that we did, um, we didn't do a deep clean before. Um, so whereas we, we we did see a reduction, um, obviously that the reduction wasn't um, as um, as good, uh, if that's the right word that that, that we would expect to see. Um, however, once we then did a deep clean and then followed it up with the sanitizer, um, then we started to get some, you know, some some really great results, um, um, and and hence why the, the, the housing associations that that we've worked with, um, you know, have then taken our our product to help them um, deliver their own damp and mold um, sort of strategies. Um, I think the key thing for me in terms of of where the sanitizer uh, sits um, in relation to our abs law. Um, I guess if you've got an emergency situation where you, you know, you, emergency repairs really need to be undertaken, you know, and you've got a resident that, that that's really, um, you know, that they're worried, that they're, that they're panicking, you know, I, I think if the housing association is able to undertake, um, you know, some emergency repairs, um, you know, complete the, the, the mould wash, operate the sanitizer. you know, th there's, there's pretty much not more that you can do um, in an emergency situation. I think you really are going over and above, um, you know, and really demonstrating that, you know, you, you've got a practical solution um, to, to deal with this and make sure that the, you know, that the, the, the resident feels safe and, uh, and assured and that that room at that time, you know, as, as far as you can, uh, as you can guarantee, um, it, it is as free from mould spores as it can be. Um, obviously, if the um, if the, the cosmetic repairs, you know, if there's a leak or you know if, if the slate's missing from from the roof or, or whatever it may be, um, if those repairs then are, are not undertaken, obviously the the, the mold will will grow back. Um, you know, so you need to repeat that process again. Um, but where we, we we think we can really help, um, you know, it is around making those emergency repairs. Um, uh, and doing um, what what the housing associations need to do um, quickly. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and hand back across to to, to, to Carl. Thank you, Helen. Um, that was really good. That was um, it was really good to hear some um, specific learning and, and seeing some case studies and potential solutions there. Really, really good. Um, could I ask all the panel to turn their cameras back on uh, if they haven't already? And we can now go to the Q&A. We've had quite a few questions in. So we've had questions on uh, on the really broad topic, but also some quite specific ones as well. Um, I, I think to, the, the first one I want to come to is, um, is is quite a broad one but it's it's about um so it it says beyond the immediate health hazards addressed by our law what broader implications might arise in terms of long-term property maintenance investment strategies and sus sustainability of housing portfolios um so I, I think as as neil touched on earlier there's there's a lot of um prioritization of spend at the moment is, is a big thing and um housing associations um uh, cash and interest cover is, is is getting squeezed for various reasons so what are the long term implications for the for the property portfolio neil I, I'm, I'm i'm i think this might be a good one for you to come to, come to yeah no problem so you know for us i think that addressing the immediate issue is one thing but then looking at the long term issues so you know, I think the one thing that traditionally probably a lot of landlords didn't touch in the past was we looked at ventilation. We used to have standard vents we used all the time. Uh, we recognise now that ventilation is is obviously key to like many issues. Um, it goes beyond what we've traditionally done. So we need to factor that in our long term maintenance programmes. We also need to make sure that they're working properly because we never really had proper servicing regimes for things like extractor fans and things like that. We clearly need to do that. I think the 
the biggest thing that I'm really conscious of as well, and it's not all about heat, but heat is obviously a, another key aspect. You know, people's really struggling at the moment. You know, you know, the economy is really difficult for many. So we need to make sure that our homes are as efficient as possible. And I think that links into what you've been discussing this afternoon in terms of sustainability, but making sure our homes are as warm as they can make sure that our heating is as efficient as it can be, making sure that our heating controls are easy to use and simple because I think that's what everyone always tells us they need to be simple you know that all costs money that all needs to be programmed to make sure we do that effectively moving forward because if we can't create a home what people can easily control easily heat and easily ventilate straight away we've got an issue so I think it goes beyond the normal stock investment it goes on to really preventative measures in terms of what can we really do to make that home a better environment uh, to serve our customers okay and and um do you think um do you think it would be easy for smaller rps to to carry out some of these changes i'm just i'm just trying to think given that there's quite a lot of financial i think i think the changes i just mentioned are the changes with the exception of some of the sustainability changes the the, the changes are fairly straightforward because a lot of them are fundamental to actually resolving the initial problem you've got you need to make sure though it doesn't just stop there because you, you can resolve the issue there and then but who's to say it's not going to come back in six months so it needs to be a a long-term focus when you look at things like the home in terms of making sure it's more more energy efficient and easier to keep warm clearly there's going to be challenges for some associations more than others and i think that's a whole bigger debate that we look at in terms of the bigger area but um I think that the basic principles are, you know, you, you resolve a problem, but that problem will come back if it's not, if you don't maintain that solution, you need to keep on top of that solution. Um, Helen or Helen, do you want to come in there or Amanda? On that one? How go? Um, yeah, I think Neil's absolutely right. Um, I, I think um, the, the focus is, is on the, the, the long term solution. Um, you know, I, I think we can all do what what we think is the right thing to do in the, in, in the short term, but the, the longer term, absolutely looking through that sustainability lens. Um, you know, this this problem's not going to go away like many other problems. Um, so I think we all just need to try and think a little bit differently. Um, you know, just accept we are where we are and and, and just take responsibility to, to, to try and move forward as uh, as best we can. OK, Amanda, do you, do you have anything to add there or shall I? Well, I was just going to say, because this came as an investment sort of based question, and I think one of the issues facing uh, housing associations is this uh, sort of sort of tug of war between investment in new build and and sort of starting with properties which are actually a lot easier to maintain and have been designed with a sort of sustainable and and sort of better uh, sort of from a design point of view the maintenance is easier um, and and I think typically over the last few years a lot of housing associations the larger ones have really put a lot of their energies into new build whereas this legislation is very much about pulling you back and putting money into existing stock. I think the idea was really very much build new, decant into the new stock and then probably demolish and start again with some of this old stock that is really problematic and very challenging to maintain. But this legislation is actually bringing the, the, the existing stock back very much front and foremost of, of, of budgeting for housing associations. And I think also the, the focus on responsive repairs which is in OARB's law, is difficult for a lot of organisations who have got budgets for capital works where they'll go through a block and they'll do all the changes of a particular type in one fell swoop. Or, or um, This is requiring sort of an immediate uh, response and that's therefore a different budget for, for most organisations. And I think that challenge between how you spend your money on new bill, capital, capital projects and responsive repairs is, is, is going to be difficult for organisations where money is tight. Okay, thank thank you, Amanda. I'm I'm going to move on um, to um, to a to a, another question. So, uh, John Milner, who's a partner at Bailey Garner, and he um, he says that you know, they are chartered building surveyors, and he's been uh, involved in in working on the damp and uh, mould um, toolkit that has been supported by Delux. So, 
uh, he sounds like he, he knows what he's talking about, but he's saying that he believes that the timescales do not allow for an effective forensic analysis of dampness, which may be affecting the home before turning to occupation issues. So um, I don't know whether the panel has any thoughts on that. I mean, um, I, I think in terms of the investigation, I think, Neil, you said that it, it, you could work within those timescales, but is, is there, are there issues around uh, whether there's enough time to properly investigate some of these issues? So it, it's entirely true that some, are, some issues are far more complex than others. I think, um, you know, we've been very honest at Hyde that in terms of, in the past, everyone sees that damp mould and condensation, everyone automatically draws the conclusion towards condensation. And I think when you actually look deep into the property, quite often there is a leak of some sort there. That's our experience. Um, so I think the immediate issue in terms of stopping, stopping the leak, that's very easy to address. But once you actually start getting into fixing the long term problem, working with the, the customer to understand what the solution is, what they need to do, what we need to do. It's it's not a it's not sometimes a quick win situation. You know, sometimes we have got long term issues in terms of affordability around heating. Sometimes we have got wider issues in terms of living space and overcrowding. Um, there could be a whole host of things that takes careful consideration. So I think Doing the initial work in the 14 days is one thing to actually long term resolve the problem. So completing the repair in a reasonable time, that's when the reasonable time bit comes into the equation, because to actually find a long term sustainable solution, quite right, sometimes it takes a lot longer. And the immediate issue to hand is that isn't the root cause. There's a there's another issue that we need to address. And, and many times that that takes a lot of work in and uh, agreement with the customer. Yeah, OK. Helen, Helen, does that um, does that tally with your experience at JLA? Yeah, um, I think some of the the, the properties um, that, that we went to, um, as Neil has explained, exactly that situation where the housing association are, are doing their best to work with the resident, but there isn't an overnight fix. The, the, these these things take time, um, and you know Neil's already said it. You know, there's often there's, there's families involved here. You know, individuals. Um, it's it's really really important to to engage with the residents and just communicate well with them, and that's certainly been our experience. It's the same, I guess, in in any kind of um, you know situation. You know, even if you've got no news to tell them, just keeping that that communication loophole, uh, sorry, that that loop open, um, you know, often goes a, a really long way. Yeah. Okay, uh, Amanda, do you, do you have anything to add? Well, I was just going to say to John, I, I, I thought it's, it's interesting the point he makes because what we saw after, because he's making it from a surveyor as in going out and doing these uh, yeah. investigations, and what we saw after Grenfell was, uh, and, and still are experiencing, is a massive shortage of people qualified to do fire risk assessments properly and fire engineers. And, and I can see that if all how, social housing landlords are needing surveyors to go in with the expertise to look at a specific problem like damp and mould or what whether it's fire safety or whatever, there may well be a shortage in the industry of people with the appropriate qualifications who can do that role. And therefore you'll wait for them to come, which means you might, your 14 day window uh, may not be met. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just, I, I just want to ask a question uh, briefly about um, communication with the supply chain, basically. So um, I just wondered whether, to what extent there'll be uh, changes to the way um, uh, registered providers communicate with with their supply chain and contractors as a result of this um, legislation? I don't know who that's. An, I don't know who wants to come in on on, on that one. Well, I'm happy to go first. The, um, I mean, we're doing an awful awful lot of work with our supply chain because I think. Um, you know, people talk about humidity levels, you know, getting that information to be actually be uh, re responsive um, when we need to be. So we've actually constantly monitoring the conditions within the home. So we're speaking to providers of things like uh, thermostats, boilers, all type of things to actually get that sort of live technology to assist us what we need to do. So I think that's a that's a constant sort of challenge to us. Also going back to our supply chain to give them information about what our customers 
so you feel about some of the stuff we use in our home so we all know that if we do install mechanical equipment the first question we've got is how much is this is it really expensive so having really simple information to give to our customers to say actually it doesn't cost a lot of money this is why we're doing it this is what we need to do to actually explain that when we go into our homes to apply mold products for instance um, that's a concern. People have been living with a situation where they're really worried about their, the welfare of their children, for instance. We're then going to apply something to their wall. They want to know exactly what we're putting on their wall, and that's only fair. And I think it's taken a step back to understand those issues, to say, actually, this is an extremely difficult situation. This is what we're going to do. We're going to work with you to resolve it. This is exactly the product we're going to apply. And I think the last bit is all trying to link that back down to the to the future, which is going to be... How do we link it to AI to try and understand how can we really take a preventative approach to look at our homes and understand in advance when we might have an issue? And I think that's clearly where we are at the moment. And we're working hard with our suppliers to help us to get that technology, that data, that knowledge to try and help us to improve moving forward. Okay, that, that, that's really interesting, Neil. And maybe maybe uh, maybe we should come we should. Um, come back to the, the point around data, data in a minute. But on, on the um, on the supply chain point, um, I don't know, Amanda, is is how do, how do you see the legislation changing that kind of um, correspondence and communication between social landlords and contractors? Uh, well, I thought it was really interesting what Neil was saying about they've taken it their sort of a lot of their suppliers back in house in effect in terms of the direct. Uh, labour organisation approach to it, which makes a lot of sense. But typically, we've had situations in the past where contractors are pretty arm's length, but they are managing the resident engagement, they're managing the um, appointments, and they're managing, um, you know, the the data on repairs and what work has been done. And and that has been a problem for housing associations in terms of actually when something goes wrong, actually finding they haven't got the information. So I think. A more joined up approach and those that are into a more sort of partnering arrangement is definitely the way forward because that communication piece is, is absolutely key and you can enshrine it in law uh, you know in contracts but at the end of the day you've got to have people who understand what you're aiming for with that legislation it isn't just about saving money and doing it as efficiently as possible in, from a cost point of view it's about that bigger uh, joined up approach amongst the, the supply chain and bearing in mind they are from the people who are dealing at the sharp end with your residents. Helen, is uh, you're not in your head. Do you, do you agree with that one? Yeah, um, I think um, with you know the housing customers that, that we've worked with, it's, a, it's that partnership approach. So um, we found that um, some housing associations perhaps did subcontract out um, their, their repairs, but um, then lots are, are now starting to bring it in, uh, bring it in house, um, so that they've got more control over it. And uh, as Amanda said, um, you know it's the contractors that they're at, at, at the front end. Uh, you know they're the ones that are liaising with with the residents day in day out. So um, you know uh, certainly the, the feedback we've had and the experiences that, that we've had with our own housing customers is um, they do tend to be they seem to be moving more towards an, an in-house model so that they, they've got that control. Uh, but those that are using uh, subcontractors, it's definitely it's that that, that partnership agreement and, and trying to move forward together. Oh, can I can I just add if I can? You know, for our frontline services. It's all about um, empathy. It's all about building trust. You know, when we get to some, when we go to someone's home, I think traditionally in the past, if you look what might have happened 10, 15 years ago, there was a lot of defensiveness. There was a lot of command and control in terms of this is what we're going to do, and not a lot of talking. You know, you've got you've got to go to someone's home. You've got to build empathy. You've got to understand the situation. You then build trust. You then work with the customer to try and resolve the issue. That's a totally different approach. So when I said that we're actually changing the culture that's the culture we need to like strive to achieve because that's the only way we're going to get on top of these some of these issues because you know to really understand what's going on to care and then make changes which is going to resolve that long term that's the solution it's not going in to say let's try this and we'll come back in six months time and see if it works mm. and that that's behind uh, i mean um on housing today we reported um recently that hyde is you're reducing your patch sizes, aren't you? To kind of, I'm assuming that's part of that thinking, is it? 
So the neighborhood model source reduced that, I say, down to um, largest patch size is now 750. And that was because um, we used to we used to say that we talked and listened to our customers, but we didn't really, because when we spoke to them, you know, the feedback was that they didn't still didn't trust us as much as we'd like them to. We still didn't talk to them as much as we needed to. Now we're in and about our homes and estates. And what we the reason why the digital platform is so important, one, it's getting that communication chain and the data and everything at everyone's fingertips. But it's also being able to do your work while you're out and about within our home. So we haven't got to go back to the office. So um, our, our intention definitely is a complete reverse of what we was doing before. As more of our staff as possible on site, working with our customers, doing their daily sort of chores. And then hopefully that way um, we, we start to understand all the issues, you know, and quite often we might say, oh, why are you here? Would you mind knocking on, on such and such door? Because I think that they might have a more problem. They might need someone to talk about. It's not something they would have contacted us in the past, but they will now for working in and around their homes and communities. So that's why we think it's important. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on to um, a question from a, um, a social housing tenant, um, James Hannigan. He's a tenant of Taurus, uh, which I believe is in Liverpool, isn't it? Um, but he, his question is about, he's, he's, he's talking about the exodus of, um, he says, housing operatives, um, housing staff leaving the sector to go to the private sector, lack of skills. Uh, I mean, basically, I think the thrust of his question is, is, is how, how well equipped is the workforce in social housing to actually um, tackle damp and mould and improve, um, improve the situation? Um, I don't know who wants to come in on that one. I feel like I'm going to kneel a lot because there's a lot of questions about RPs, but any anybody who wants to jump in on that one, feel free to. I'm happy to go first us again, if that's all right. <laughs> um, you know, you make a really good point because um, skills is a declining area for us. It's a huge concern. It's something that we are... We're actively, we're actively going around our schools at the moment in the communities we work to actually talk about apprenticeships to get people back into the industry because a lot of people have moved away. And um, when, you, when you look at the actual skills we've got across the sector, they're in decline. And we need to get more people in and we need to train more people out. Now, fortunately, we're in a position at the moment where I think we have got enough people with the right skills. But if we don't do anything about it, it won't last. And so we've got to we've got to go out and publicise what we do, show people that it's a, it's a good thing to do and it's quite a good area to work, and encourage people back in. And if you look beyond what we're doing around AWIB's law, but you look at other areas like sustainability, there's huge opportunity moving forward. And I talked about AI before, and I think that there's an awful lot of jobs where AI will do a lot of all that work, you know, for you. But when you look at what we do about talking, listening to people, working with people, coming up with solutions, you know, that's a personal touch. That's that's a great area to work in. And I, and I think, you know, the whole thing around working in housing is we need to publicise it more and we get, need, need to get more people interested because we definitely have got a declining workforce. Absolutely. So, um, Helen or Amanda, do you want to come in on that, on the skills? Just one of the things um, I was going to cover, so um, Neil uh, has mentioned innovation, you know, um, we're, um, we're we're kind of a, a real sort of pivotal time, and now's the time to be, you know, to be bringing fresh eyes, um, you know, looking at all the, the technology that, that, that's out there, you know, bring in, um, you know, people with different skills from, from all uh, from all walks of life. Uh, you know, we, we all, we, we do have the answers. Um, you know, if we all work together, um, you know, definitely innovation, uh, using AI, using technology, um, it, it, that's, that's the road that I think we all need to be, uh, we need to be going down. So yeah, absolutely, I, I do agree with Neil. And then just on, on a final point, um, you know, lots of the tenders that, that, that we see that come out from housing associations, you know, they're looking for suppliers and they're looking to work with suppliers who are able to, um, you know, from an ESG perspective, particularly from a social perspective, you know, where can we engage residents? Where can we engage tenants? You know, where can we support 
um, you know, the, 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 the local uh, economy um, via installations, via, via servicing work, work that we do. So um, and we, we're seeing that more and more now. And that's great to see because that will help to, to, to drive the change and, and will turn the housing sector, you know, into a sector where people are, want, want to work and they see it as a, you know, as a sector where that there's lots of opportunity to, to, to make a difference and to drive change. Okay, uh, Amanda, do, do you want to add to that? Well, I would just sort of uh, add to really what Helen's just said about use of AI, as in it, it's great to save time and get to the first level or second level, but it's got to be used intelligently in terms of interacting with like a human element because you get so far with AI and then if you've got a particular problem and, and you end up just not communicating properly with it, the, you know, the alternative is speaking to somebody who actually understands and remembers and writes down what you've said and, and makes a note that is then handed on or put on your sort of file because I think that's the sort of the gaps in data within housing associations are one of their biggest problems in terms of managing risks and, and complying with their legislative um, obligations. Okay well while we're on the use of, uh, of AI because you you mentioned it uh, briefly Neil as well but um is the idea that it, through better use of data and AI and other technology that you can kind of almost predict where where issues might, might arise within your stock? Was 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 that the was that the point? You yeah, well, two points really. Absolutely, first point, yes, because um, if we manage like basic stuff like relative humidity and stuff like that, we can get early warning signs to say there might be an issue in that property. If we have um, leak detecting sensors, we can actually say that something's going on there, which it, which shouldn't be. We should go and check that out. So there's basic sort of information what will guide us. But I think the key bit to it all beyond AI, when we talk about data, is to actually get good data and share it across all the different systems we work. If we look at most landlords or large organizations, they don't just have one IT system. They might have one, two or three. We certainly got three major systems we use. In the past, they didn't all integrate and talk to each other effectively. So if I've got people out and about around their homes that I've just been sort of promoting, they need that information at the fingertips. So they need to know if they're going into a property, what are the issues? What what have we recently been involved with? What, what are we currently addressing? Um, we talk about things like vulnerabilities. You know, a lot of that is personal data, but some of the data we can easily share, we need to be able to uh, obtain that when we're out and about in our homes we need to put it on the systems we need to use it and i think um in the past all that was on a variety of different platforms some people put it in spreadsheets some people put it in a notebook and now it's making sure that all that data is available to help us to quickly understand an issue and to try and resolve it and with with ai alongside that that starts to give us even more intelligence to get to a problem quickly and do you think the regulatory changes that we've been talking about will they will they accelerate this process? Because I mean, well, there is there is a, an emphasis on record keeping and that kind of thing. Absolutely, well. because they clearly there is an emphasis on record keeping. I think quite rightly because they are saying that um, we do need to understand things like vulnerabilities. We do need to understand some of the key issues, and it, and it's not right that we over you know time and time again we take customers through to ask all these things again. We should have it on hand. And um, it's something that we should take into account when we're prioritising some of this stuff. When I when I said in my talk a bit earlier in terms of the reason why I'm worried about globally just applying this to the whole of HHSRS, you know, I, I generally believe there's some areas there which, depending on the category, are certainly more urgent than others. And I think if we're not careful, we're going to get into a whole load of bureaucracy doing written reports for some trivial matters while we're not addressing the most important ones. So I think there needs to be a clear balance. But do I think we need data? Absolutely, I do totally agree with it. Yeah. Now, any, um, I'm, I'm just uh, aware we've only got a minute or two left, but are there any final thoughts on, on that, on those points there from, from Amanda or Helen? I think just the the final point from me is, um, you know, again, just touching on what Neil just said, 
Um, so our, our our fixed assets that, that, that we install are from from a product perspective, you know, they are connected. And you, as Neil said, you, you can get the data, you can see how the assets uh, performing. But you know, it, it, it's much harder when um, you know the, the, there's families, it's individuals. Um, uh, but as Neil says, you need that that broader picture to understand um, what's going on at the time, and then you know, then you can work through what what the best solution is. So yeah, if we can take some of that learning in um from a data perspective yeah data is is it opens up so many doors for, for all of us it's really key okay thanks helen uh, any final thoughts amanda no not really just i would support what the others have said the, the, the management of data and retaining data and in a sensible place that everyone can find it is is key Okay, well, that's all we've got time for. Um, thank you very much to Amanda Neal and Helen. Um, if you want to learn more on this topic, we have a CPD in partnership with JLA, which is available from Housing Today for free. Um, and then in about an hour's time, we have another uh, webinar, which is all about sustainability and regulatory changes. But um, that's all from us for now. So thank you very much and goodbye. Thanks.